compared to the billions of other stars in our galaxy, the Sun is just an average sized star. Take a look at this size comparison of the Sun and a much larger star such as Canis Majoris or UI Scuti. So, why does the Sun seem so large and bright to people on Earth? If so much of our energy comes from fossil fuels, how is the Sun responsible for nearly all energy on Earth? And what produces its enormously high temperatures and pressures that are needed for nuclear fusion in the Sun's core to occur? In this experience, we aim to accomplish the following three objectives. Number one, develop a model of the characteristics of the Sun, including its composition, structure, and energy production. Number two, use models to describe the role of nuclear fusion in the Sun to release energy in the form of radiation. And three, explain that nuclear fusion processes in the center of the Sun release energy that ultimately reaches Earth as radiation. Let's start with some of the raw stats that describe some of the major characteristics of the Sun, shown here in this table from your text. Check the average distance of our star from Earth, about 150 million kilometers. We use our distance from the Sun to compare to distances to other far objects in the solar system. To keep things simple, we call this distance one astronomical unit, written as one AU. Given this distance, how long does it take for sunlight to reach Earth? Just a little over eight minutes. An interesting way to think of this is to ask, what would happen if the sun's light completely went dark? We wouldn't know about it until 8.32 minutes later. Next, looking at the radius and mass info, we can get an idea of the sheer size of this star. Its mass in kilograms is 1.989 times 10 to the 30 kilograms. This number is written in a format called scientific notation, which is usually reserved for writing numbers that are incredibly large or small. If we were to write this number out, we would have about two followed by 30 zeros kilograms of mass. That's two million trillion trillion. As you can see on the slide, 99.9% .9 of the mass of the entire solar system, which includes the mass of all the other planets and moons combined, comes from the sun. Planets, moons, comets, and asteroids don't even account for more than 0.1% of the solar system's mass. In fact, the Sun is large enough to hold the volume of 1.3 million Earths. Moving along, we can see the composition of the Sun, which tells us what gases make it up. About three quarters of the Sun is hydrogen gas and most of the rest is helium. This will be an important fact later when we discuss the Sun's nuclear processes as it produces energy. Speaking of energy, which is hotter, the sun's surface or the core? We can see that the core temperature is almost 16 million Kelvin compared to the near 6,000 Kelvin of the surface. That's over 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit at the surface and nearly 29 million degrees Fahrenheit at the core. As you can tell, our star is a giant beyond imagination, average as it may be. It gives off an enormous amount of energy in the form of electromagnetic radiation, better known to us as light. However, not all the sun's radiation or light is visible to us. So when you combine both the visible and invisible forms of radiation, you get the full energy production rate of 3.828 times 10 to the 26 watts. A watt is a unit of power and it measures the amount of energy transferred each second. One watt equals one joule of energy per second. The text tells us that sunlight strikes satellites at an intensity of 1360 watts per square meter. A square meter is the area of a two-dimensional square with sides equal in length to one meter. You can see this dog inside that area for comparison. So for every area this size at the distance that Earth's satellites orbit, which is a couple hundred miles above the surface, the amount of energy from the sun is 1360 watts. However, once that radiation from the sun reaches Earth, we get intensities of only about 340 watts. This tells us that the intensity of the sun's energy decreases as we get further from it. Still, this is enough energy to power the Earth's biosphere and surface geosphere. 
So with the large amount of energy available from the sun, why is life abundant on Earth and not on other planets in our solar system? As we've seen already, the intensity of the radiation or energy from the sun changes as distance from the sun changes. Planets closer to or farther from the sun get too much or too little sunlight. Only Earth is at the right distance for liquid water to exist continuously at its surface. Let's do a quick recap before moving further. We've talked about the sun's major characteristics, including its composition. It's made of mostly hydrogen and helium. Its structure, it's made of gas and over 99% of the solar system's mass. And its energy production, the amount of energy is enormous, but it decreases the farther you get from it. Let's shift our focus to the nuclear fusion process in the sun to model how it releases energy in the form of that radiation. The sun produces energy through a process called nuclear fusion, and this process happens in the core or the center of the sun. The gravitational force is so strong here in this part of the star that it produces the extremely high temperatures and pressures that are needed for fusion. See, fusion doesn't just happen unless you have an incredible amount of energy to produce a fusion reaction. Fusion means the fusing or combination of two or more separate objects into one. And nuclear refers to the particles that make up the nucleus of an atom. At the simplest level, the nucleus is composed of two kinds of particles, protons and neutrons. Electrons occupy a space around the nucleus. Investigation 14 on nuclear physics discusses these particles and their reactions in much greater detail. All we need to know is that nuclear fusion means the combination of particles that make up the nucleus of an atom, protons and neutrons. An element gets its identity from the number of protons inside the atom's nucleus. And every single different element has a different number of protons. The sun is made up of mostly hydrogen and helium. And we can see that hydrogen has only one proton in its nucleus, and helium has two protons and two neutrons. The fusion reaction in the sun's core is called the proton-proton chain. And there are many steps and different pathways to the end products, but the basic process is shown here in this graphic. In short, protons from hydrogen nuclei, plural for nucleus, collide with such great force that they stick together and fuse. And this sets off a chain reaction of further high energy collisions until helium-4 is created. This reaction takes two lighter elements in hydrogen and fuses them to form a heavier element in helium. And it releases a large amount of energy in the process. It's this energy that gets released through the proton-proton chain of nuclear fusion that powers the sun and allows it to release energy. Let's take a deep look into the sun then. Actually, that's not close enough. We need to take a look inside. The conditions inside the sun are well beyond anything in human experience. If you travel just 30% of the distance from the sun's surface to its center, the sun is already too hot for elements to exist as atoms. Instead, matter is a bubbling plasma of charged particles, like protons, electrons, and larger nuclei. Plasma is a state of matter, like a solid, liquid, or gas, but its particles can spread apart, and it lacks a shape or volume. The sun's interior can be broken down into three main layers, as shown here in this model which shows the core, the radiative zone, and the convective zone. The reactions and processes that happen in each zone determines how energy spreads outward through the sun and eventually reaches us. To begin, we start with the core. Heat is produced in the core through nuclear fusion, and this heat transfers outward as radiation in the form of gamma rays, which is the most energetic form of radiation on the electromagnetic spectrum. Most of the sun's heat is generated as these gamma rays, so it makes sense that the layer of the sun outside the core is called the radiative zone. The particles in the plasma are continuously absorbing and re-emitting the gamma rays in this zone. As you near the surface of the sun, the temperature decreases and convection occurs, 
which is a process of hot gas rising and cooler gas sinking in convection cells. You can see the convection cells as the shape-shifting granules shown here in this incredibly close view of the sun. So, we've covered some of the inner workings of the sun. I think it's time to cool off a bit. <sighs> we can cool off as we move outward to the atmospheric layers of the sun. Specifically, there are three layers to the sun's atmosphere. The photosphere, the chromosphere, and the corona. This collection of four images shows the beauty of these layers by using filters for different temperatures of the sun. Since each layer of the atmosphere has a different temperature, these filters allow for viewing the different characteristics of each layer. We'll start with the photosphere, the first layer of the sun's atmosphere. This is the coolest location in the sun, with temperatures around 5800 Kelvin. The visible light image on the left shows the photosphere, which is an apt name for this layer. Photo in science means light, so this layer is literally named sphere of light. This is where the energy from the sun radiates as the light that spreads throughout and warms the solar system. Next, we can look at the chromosphere, the next layer of the sun's atmosphere outward and above the photosphere. The second image in the four image compilation shows the chromosphere, taken with an ultraviolet light filter showing objects at one million Kelvin. Remember, human eyes cannot detect radiation outside of the visible light portion of the light spectrum, so using a UV filter for this light allows us to see things that our eyes cannot. This layer shows solar flares near the top of it, and it is much less dense than the photosphere. The part of the chromosphere that is nearer to the photosphere is lower in temperature, about 4,000 Kelvin. But this temperature actually increases much higher as you travel to the outer layer of the atmosphere, the corona. This layer is less dense than the chromosphere, and because it is one million times less bright than the photosphere, you can only see it from Earth during a total eclipse. The corona can be seen in the far image to the right here, taken with an ultraviolet light filter showing objects at two million Kelvin. Here you can see the high energy streamers of plasma that can extend for millions of kilometers out into space. Sometimes we can see sunspots when looking at the photosphere. Remember that we can see this layer using regular visible light images. We don't need a filter like we do for seeing other ranges of radiation. We just need a protective filter. Anyway, although they are not really spots, but rather regions where strong magnetic fields from the sun entangle and prevent heat from reaching the surface, they appear darker. As you can see in the image, sunspots tend to gather in clusters. And while they seem like small areas, which they are relative to the sun, in reality, they're quite large compared to us. A single sunspot is about the size of Earth. <music> Lastly, let's talk about space weather. This is a term given to particles shot out from the sun that reach Earth. And as you might imagine, some of the weather coming from the sun can potentially be quite dangerous. This is definitely one great ball of fire. Solar wind happens when energetic charged particles escape the sun. These are mostly electrons, protons, and nuclei, and about a million tons of them blast away from the sun. These particles, or wind, can break down the atmospheres of planets that don't have magnetic fields to shield, like Mars, which has seen one third of its atmosphere wiped away by the solar wind. The image on this slide shows a coronal mass ejection, or CME, which can blast away as much as a trillion kilograms of superheated gas at hundreds of kilometers each second. Solar flares can exceed energy levels of 10 to the 25th joules. In case you don't have that calculation automatically on hand, that's about the equivalent of more than a billion nuclear bombs. So you might be thinking, 
If the sun is continuously spouting off all this dangerous mix of radiation and particles into the solar system at incredibly high speeds, what danger does that pose to Earth? Well, first off, thankfully we have a protective shield in our planet's magnetic field, which can fend off a normal amount of solar wind and other mass ejections. But strong activity from the sun can push through our defenses and can be dangerous to our communication satellites causing surges in our electricity power lines, which can cause power outages, and it can be dangerous to astronauts. Space weather is also a major reason why colonizing Mars would be a significant challenge. Never mind the lack of water and oxygen, the red planet doesn't have nearly the natural defense system that Earth has to protect it from the sun. This video has covered quite a bit about the Sun. We've talked about the Sun's major characteristics, like its mass, its size, and its extreme temperatures. We've talked about the drop-off of energy from the Sun as you increase distance from it, and that the Earth receives just the right amount of energy to sustain life. We covered the nuclear fusion reaction, specifically the proton-proton chain, that powers the Sun's core and how the fusion energy is transferred outward to the radiative and convective zones of the sun's inner regions. We've seen the three layers of the sun's atmosphere, including sunspots that are the size of Earth. Lastly, we've seen how space weather from the sun can be dangerous to the Earth and other planets in the solar system. In the next experience in Investigation 16 on the Universe, you will learn about the different stars in our galaxy and their life cycles, including star formation and death. See you next time.